Yet the Son of Man, when He comes, shall He find faith, think you, on the earth? Luke chapter 18. Shall He find faith on the earth? Now faith, St. Paul says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things to be hoped for, the evidence. It's the evidence of things that appear not. The evidence of things that appear not. Evidence. If it weren't true that our Lord rose from the dead, don't you think somebody somewhere would have written about how scandalized they were that, the, that it just wasn't a fact? He never rose from the dead. I never saw him. I watched him die on the cross and I never saw him rise from the dead. Don't you think somebody would have been outraged? Not one account has ever been found anywhere of anybody contradicting any letter ever written by the apostles. That's incredible. In fact, the, the pagans didn't even bring it into dispute. Nobody brought it into dispute because they're seeing these miracles. Evidence. They're seeing miracles happening in front of their eyes. St. Paul they would take his handkerchief out and he would heal people. St. Peter would walk past people and a shadow would heal them. Evidence. But what about in our age? Where's the proof? Where's the proof of your faith? Do you see? Our faith is to be proved by not the evidence of somebody else's miracles, not that we have to be working miracles, in the sense that I have to walk past somebody and my shadow will, will bring back their, will heal their body. That doesn't have to happen. But where are the giants of our faith? Since Padre Pio, who is there? You get all these apparitions and these other, and there's always weird stuff with it nowadays. You, you get somebody that has some kind of stigmata or some kind of whatever's happening. There's something weird going on there. There's always something weird. But back with Padre Pio, that was weird, but there was nothing weird going on. It's strange that a man can bleed for 50 years, but the fact is, he was holy. And everyone knew it. There was proof. So where are the giants today? There aren't any. Why? Because we don't have faith. When the Son of Man comes back, think you, shall he find faith? That's a strong question to ask, not of your neighbor, not of your wife, of yourself. You have to ask that question. For us Christians, it's not the arguments or the apologetics on the faith which prove the veracity, but the purity of our lives. It's the purity of our lives. How many of you use those phones for things that aren't pure? I don't want to see a show of hands. So the faith is proved by the veracity of Not the veracity of our arguments, but the purity of our lives. That is the uncom uncom um, uncompromising struggle with virtue. Can you imagine if you had Christians today that uncompromisingly struggled to obtain virtue? It almost doesn't make any sense for us to even hear the words. Because none of us are doing it. You'd see it. You'd see people struggling with it. You'd see it because the wife wouldn't be complaining about her husband. She'd be mortifying what she says. The husband wouldn't be doing stuff in secret. He'd be, he'd be, he'd be showing his children an example of a holy life. Do you see? We wouldn't be making excuses for all of our downfalls. We'd be trying to correct them. Struggling with virtue. We're not called to be nice people, but saints. And the saints were often misunderstood. They were persecuted. They were afflicted. They were asked to endure great hardship. As St. Paul says, 
of himself persecutions, afflictions, such as came upon me at Antioch and Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. What's that mean he delivered him? He got stoned to death. I mean, he, and he did get stoned to death. They went out to the outside of the town, and he rose up out of the rubble, and he walked back into town. They weren't throwing pebbles at the guy, okay? One person explained it to me. They would throw them over a cliff, and then they would take a big boulder and drop it on them. They knew how to stone somebody to death. And St. Paul just got back up and walked into the town where the townsmen, where the, where the disciples there said, could you please maybe go on to the next town? And so he did. And what happened there? Well, the whole town went into an outrage. Then they beat him there too. And then what did he do? He went to the next town. The same thing happened there. What if that happened to you? Please, Lord, why don't you treat me nice? I pray and you don't answer me. You never hear my prayers. You don't love me. That's what we say. You know you all say it. Maybe not all of you. But let's look at it. I want to look at it a little bit. I didn't read the whole quote, so let me read, let me read it over again. <clears throat> this is from 1 Timothy 3.11. Persecutions, afflictions, such as came upon me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he continues, St. Paul continues, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. You okay with that? You okay with suffering a persecution for our Lord? I'm glad to hear some people are. Most are not. It was just after these persecutions that St. Paul... So he's going through this, when you're looking at this, this is in <coughs> chapters kind of 13, 14, really 14, and then going into 15. He goes through and they do their first um, evangelical circuit. And then after getting beat up and thrown out of enough towns, St. Paul says, let's go back and just see how everybody's doing. So they walk back, and as they go back, they establish the church in each one of these communities, meaning they, lay, they do the laying of the hands, they make bishops, they make priests, they establish a hierarchy in each community, and now they have the sacraments, which they didn't seem to have done that on the way up, but they do it on the way back. And this is what he says to one of the communities there who were pagan. And they're brand new Christians. Most of you aren't brand new Christians. You've been Christians most of your life. You've come, some of you have come from Christian cultures. And this is what he says to people who he's just given them a gospel absolutely contrary to everything they've ever understood. And they've been brand new Christians for a short time. He says this. He exhorts them to continue in the faith, and then listen to this, and that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God. Are you okay with that? Many tribulations. You men, are you okay with failing? Are you okay with failing in front of your wife by risking on God? By risking on our dear Lord? Or will you fight at all costs to keep your good name? To keep the job, to keep the income? Are you willing to face the many tribulations that lay ahead in your faith, in your life, and the faith as you should? These are thing, uh, things are growing worse, and we continue and will continue even more. Are you prepared to keep facing it? As Christians, we must face it. And we must face it as Christ Jesus our Lord. Where did, his, where did his persecution end? Crucifixion and death. Christ, 
His life ended with crucifixion and death. We're baptized into that body. Do you see? Not the victorious, glorious church of the Christianitas. That's what we want back. We want this big, glorious church so we can all be looked at respectfully. The Christianitas is the Christendom, right? It's Christendom. But how? How are we to face it as Christ Jesus, our Lord? <clears throat> our Lord said in Matthew 4.17, do penance. For the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do penance. First words. You look in the Gospels, the first things He does is tell people to do penance. The Word of God came. And gave us His Word in the Scriptures. And He made it so that the first thing we hear to do is to do penance. And what do we do? We try to avoid it at all costs. Luxury apartments. Luxury car. How you just want to have that. That you've always wanted that car. You're going to put yourself yourself in financial debt for it. But you've always wanted it. You've just always wanted it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You should have it. Penance. I'm not going to go into the things of Our Lady of Fatima, but that should be very, very present to us. Her yelling at these, no, she wasn't yelling, you know she wasn't, but at these, at these little children to do penance. At St. Bernadette to do penance. Do you see? That all applies to us. She's talking to us. And Matthew eleven twelve says, And from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent bear it away. Are you among the ranks of the holy violent? Could you put yourself in the ranks of the holy violent who bear heaven away? These are, I'm asking this, is, these are reflections. And these are the kind of reflections you use, you should use in your daily meditation, which I know most of you aren't doing. St. Alphonsus says if you don't pray, you're not going to be saved. He who he he, um, he prega si salva. Those are the words of Saint Alphonsus. He who prays will be saved. Meditation is a very important thing. These are questions you would bring up in your meditation. You would ponder them before our dear blessed Lord. Not necessarily if you can't make it to the church and do it in front of the blessed sacrament. You all I know that you all don't live right down the street from the blessed sacrament here. You can pray in your house. So these are things to ponder. When I'm asking you these questions, they're things for you to ponder on. Are you among the holy violent? The fact is that we've grown cold and ignorant of our Christian dignity and duty. It was no different in the time of St. Francis. And here's where I want to start to read to you a few different things from the popes. These beautiful encyclicals Before, when the encyclical used to be readable within a half an hour, Pope Leo XIII, Pius XI, uh, Benedict XV, they all wrote very beautiful encyclicals. There was more written than that. But they wrote very beautiful encyclicals about St. Francis. And I want to read to you some of these quotes as they kind of fill in the blanks for us in this topic. Leo XIII says this, The tone and temper of our time seems, for many reasons, to be similar to those, that is of St. Francis. For as in the 12th century, seems a long time ago, and he's seeing that there's something very similar here. In the 12th century, divine charity had grown cold. So also it is now. Nor is the neglect of Christian duty small. Whether for ignorance or neglect, or negligence. And with the same bent on like desires, many consuming their days and hunting for conveniences of life, and greedily following after pleasure, overflowing with luxury, they wasted their own and they coveted the substance of others, extolling indeed the name of human fraternity. We hear a lot about that today in the church. 
they nevertheless speak more fraternally than they act. For they are carried away by self-love and the genuine charity towards the poor and the helpless is daily diminished. In the time we are speaking of, the manifold errors of the Albigenses by stirring up the masses against the powers of the church had dis- disturbed society and paved the way of a kind of socialism. Do you see? We, ha- we see that happening in our own country now. It paved the way for a type of socialism back in the 12th century. And in our day, likewise, the, the favorers and propagators of materialism have increased who obstinately deny the submission to the church is due, now today we have these members in the church denying submission to the church. And hence, proceeding gradually beyond all bounds, do not even spare the civil powers. They approve of violence and seditions among the people. They attempt a gregarian outbreaks. They flatter the desires of the pro- a pro, te, a pro proletariat, and they weaken the foundation of domestic and public order. That's Leo the Thirteenth, and it does sound a bit like today. He continues, certainly the greatest origin both of uh, both of evils which press us, and of the dangers which are feared is the neglect of Christian virtue. Can you imagine? You watch the nightly news, which I know a lot of you, maybe not the nightly news, but everybody likes to watch the news now, especially traditional Catholics. Everybody's waiting for the shoe to drop, and so you keep an eye on the, the, those phones to see what the next news story is because you're basically addicted to negative stories. You see? We know because we publish stuff on Census Fidelium And I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's a little station. We'll publish stuff on Census Fidelium. And to get people to watch it, you've got to give it a negative title. World's coming to an end. Pope Francis is in jail. You've got to say something absolutely crazy, and it has to be negative, or no one will watch your video, no matter how good it is. Right? It's it's absolutely terrible. We we, we published a video that we made about the project. uh, We're trying to keep people updated on. We're trying to build a friary and a... um, a retreat center so we can bring people to come pray where we are. And we published it and it just, it's a beautiful video. Um, But to publish that, we put pictures of Pope Francis and the the Cardinal in charge of the Congregation for the Faith and bombs going off and and had to title it, uh, like, what was it titled? Something about modernism and, and crisis and all this stuff. You give it all these terrible names and then you just write a response. (laughs) <laughs> and then they get on there. It has nothing to do with Pope Francis or, or bombs. It just has to do with, you know, we wanted to show people something beautiful. Uh, we weren't trying to give them that, but we wanted to show them something very positive. Like, what do you do in a time of crisis? You just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Your, your job's to be holy. We're just going to keep trying to be holy. And here you go. This is, this is the way forward. And people are like, oh, thank you. That's what we needed. <laughs> So the lack is the, the, the great fear is the, and is the neglect of Christian virtue. This is, so, this is so absolutely pertinent for today. It's Christian virtue. If you could make people, because we're not going to change, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, I mean, we don't want the world to get worse and worse and worse. But you watching the news doesn't make it better. Understanding that things are getting worse doesn't really help you in your spiritual life or protect your family. You know it doesn't. It makes you make bad decisions. Yet now your wife's looking at you because you filled up the basement full of ammunition and all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of goods from the store that have expired now it, because you were watching the news all the time. It is, he says, and this is also from Leo XIII, in this century appeared St. Francis. Yet with wondrous resolution and simplicity, he undertook to place before the eyes of the aging world, you think aging world, it was, things were getting old because people weren't living holy lives. 
the place before the aging world in his words and deeds, the complete model of Christian perfection. St. Pius XI admonishes us and says this, and if you, anybody wants these encyclicals, and I do encourage you to read them, they're beautiful encyclicals, they're not super duper long. You can get them all, the PDFs are all on our website. You can just click on it, you can read it there. I do encourage you, they're, they're very beautiful encyclicals. But this is Rite, uh, Rite Expiatus by Pius XI. He says, it seems necessary for us to affirm that there has never been anyone in whom the image of Jesus Christ and the evangelical manner of life shone forth more lifelike and strikingly than in St. Francis. He who called himself the herald of the great king was also rightly spoken of as another Jesus Christ, appearing, this is the Pope writing this, appearing to his contemporaries and to future generations, almost as if he were the risen Christ. That's a big deal for a Pope to say about a saint. <clears throat> it goes much further than butterflies and bird baths. The St. Francis that we hear about all the time, that's not the St. Francis uh, that walked the earth. He loved God, and so he loved everything that God made. But he loved what God made because he loved God. So as Christ inspired the Jews to repent, so he sends us as saints. And St. Francis, it was as though he came again. It's a beautiful thing to think of. And why was it that St. Just because God made him that way? No, because St. Francis responded to the grace of God. What would happen if you responded to the grace of God? Would it be like Christ was made present again? amongst your neighbors or your family members? Yes, it would be. Because you're a member of the body of Christ. The greatest work of repentance that we can do is to be perfect. Which means to grow in all the virtues, striving in Christian perfection. When you hear a sermon that goes bad, and you hear that it's not possible for us to become perfect after hearing Scripture when it talks about be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Sometimes you'll hear said, it's not possible that we become perfect. That's true in one regard. And it's not true in another regard. It's true in the sense that you can't become perfect until you have obtained your perfection. And that can't happen while you're still changing every day. In life you change every day. And so you can't arrive at absolute perfection in this life because you're constantly changing. Right? That name which God wants to give you is in heaven. And that's where you'll obtain your perfection if you strive for it. You don't just stumble onto it. If you strive for that protect, for perfection according to the grace of God, you will become perfect. But you don't just accidentally become perfect. The other, in the way that we do become perfect in this life, is that we strive according to God's grace to unite ourselves to his perfection. Do you see? We cooperate and participate. The proper word here is participate in his, per, in his perfections. That's what we do by struggling with virtue. He says this, Leo XIII says this about that. Now the perfection of Christian virtue lies in that disposition. Please listen. This is a very beautiful definition that he gives what it means to strive for Christian perfection. It lies in that disposition of soul which dares. It dares all that, this especially for men, if you want to know what manliness is, it's not about shooting guns and wrestling bare-chested with pigs. It's about this. This is manliness right here. And women are called to manliness. It's not, not to be feminists or whatever. It's to have that strong, that strong heart is what Scripture talks about. We're all called to this. It dares all that is arduous or difficult. Its symbol is the cross, which those who would follow Jesus Christ must carry on their shoulder. The effects of this disposition are a heart detached from mortal things, 
complete self-control, and a gentle and resigned endurance of adversity. Endurance of adversity. I've had enough. Do you ever say it? I'm sick of it. I can't take it anymore. A heart detached from mortal things. Complete self-control and a gentle and resigned endurance of adversity. And fine, the love of God continues, Leo the 13th. The love of God and of one's neighbor is the mistress and sovereign of all other virtues. Such is its power that it wipes away all the hardship that accompany the fulfillment of duty. You wives, the fulfillment of duty, taking care of all the children when you want to rip your hair out. Fulfillment of duty. You men who have to go out and labor out in the world. I know some of the ladies do too. I'm not trying to say, but our duties are sometimes difficult to do. By accepting them, it's penance. See, it's built in. And renders the hardest labors not only bearable, but agreeable. Look at that. Not only bearable, but agreeable. I think it was Saint uh, Saint John of the Cross. He endured quite a bit as a religious. He really had to go through a lot. Not just because he went through dark nights and stuff like that. His own his own brothers threw him in like a little tiny cell that he couldn't even stand up in or anything. He was in the dark all the time. Then they would pull him out once a week and beat him publicly. I mean, he went through a lot. And did he complain about it? No, he wrote a be- beautiful poem. <laughs> that was his response. And when he finally escaped, he's emaciated, whatever, he, he lowered himself down. I don't even know how he escaped. He, he escapes finally, and, and he gets to the sisters, leaning on the wall because he can barely stand, starts to talk about how beautiful God is. You do that. And you're supposed to do that. It's not just for St. John. Therefore, Pius XI says in Rite Expiatis, as a matter of fact, by his practice of all the virtues in a heroic manner, by the austerity of his life and his preaching of penance, by his manifold and restless activities for the reformation of society, the figure of St. Francis stands forth in all its completeness, proposed to us not so much Not so much for our admiration, but for our imitation. You hear that sometimes too. The saints, some of our third order members in another state, they called me and said, I don't understand. The the, the pastor today gave a homily and what he said was about St. Francis on the Feast of St. Francis. The saints are to be, the saints aren't always to be imitated, but they're they're to be uh, admired. Well, here the Pope is saying the opposite. In the case of St. Francis, he's proposed to us not so much for our admiration, but for our imitation. Imitation, the imitation of Christ's people. As the herald of the great king, he he proposes, uh, his, his purposes were directed to persuading men to conform their lives to the dictates of evangelical sanctity and to the love of the cross. Benedict the Fifteenth says, uh, the encyclical is called Sacro Propendium. It's by Benedict the Fifteenth. He says this: In truth, what is at hand definitively is, by imitation of Saint Francis of Assisi, to open to the greatest number possible, the greatest possible number of souls, the way which will lead them back to Christ. Can you imagine? He just said the greatest possible way to to save society is to have people imitate St. Francis. That came from the Pope. In truth, what is at hand definitively is by imitation of St. Francis of Assisi to open to the greatest possible number of souls the way which will lead them back to Christ. It is this return that resides the firmest hope of salvation for society. 
The words of St. Paul, Be my imitators as I am of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, can with good right be put upon the lips of St. Francis, who in imitating the Apostle has become the most faithful image and copy of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing to have said about you. But how can we imitate such a heroic saint? That's the next question. How can you do it? He walked around barefoot in the wintertime. How can, we, how can we imitate such a heroic saint? Shouldn't we just admire him? Can you see the effeminacy coming out of the very thoughts the thought of turning from sin and turning towards the Creator? Does that make sense? Can you see the effeminacy? Meaning, when we look at the fact of what, it, what it's going to take for us to be heroic like St. Francis, you see the effeminacy come out. You see the fact that what you really want is things to go well. You want the weather to be nice. You want everyone to treat you well. You want to be accepted. And the list goes on. You kind of want things just to go well. Resistance is something that you abhor. That's a feminacy. Someone who's going to run a marathon has to have lots of resistance. They look for it. Because if you're just running on flat ground all the time, and then you go to, I don't know, San Francisco to run a marathon, I don't know what their marathons are like, but I presume they're going to make you go up one of those hills that are crazy, then you're not going to be able to do it. You need resistance to get stronger. Do you see? Let's ask what's at stake. Eternal salvation. What's at stake for not striving after this perfection is eternal salvation. Not just for ourselves, but for all those people who are supposed to come in contact with us. Our eternal reward, eternal glory, peace, rest, joy, all the things that have to do with heaven that you'll never have here. You seek it and you'll never have it. Do you see? How many of you have tried to be happy? You older people, how often have you sought happiness and it never stays? You get betrayed by a friend, husband, a wife. You can't forgive them anymore. See, it's all about you. We get beat up in this world because people live for themselves. They're not sinning against you, they're sinning against God. Do you see? Our Lord said, they asked our Lord, Lord, will few be saved? And our Lord said this, People don't ever think about this one. I don't know why they don't think about this one. They get mad when you bring it up too. But our Lord's the one who said it. I mean, you can't get mad at somebody for bringing it up. Lord, will few be saved? And our Lord said, Strive. Strive to enter by the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, shall seek to enter. They're going to seek it. They shall seek to enter. And shall not be able. But when the master of the house has gone in and shall shut the door, you shall begin to stand without and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. And he answering shall say to you, I know you not whence you are. When you hear that, it's done. No turning back. The only time to obtain salvation, right now. And it's by living the cross of our dear blessed Lord, Jesus Christ. Do you see? So what's this have to do with anything? What we propose to you is what the Christians for 800 years have done. From Pius IX to Pius XII, every single one of those pontiffs was a third order mem member of, of St. Francis. An order that he started. Now what I want to explain to you is what that is. The third order of St. Francis is not a group that follows Franciscans around. It's religious life for lay people. 
It was a religious order. Now, because that religious order has kind of gone astray in many places, we have started another one that, is, that should be an authentic observance of the third order of St. Francis. There are other ones as well. There, there have been a few others that have started here and there that have trying to be very authentic. The point is this, to follow the rule of St. Francis is that salvific means by which the Pope's talking about. At the, when you make profession, which we have a few third order members here, the ones with the big scapulars on, they're third order members who have joined uh, the, the, the third order uh, that, the, that our group um, is trying to form. Again, not to follow us around, but to be authentic third order members in the world, to make Christ present. When they make profession, which there's no vows, because people who have duties, married people in the world, can't make vows for different things. They make promises. Promises that we're all supposed to keep. The evangelical councils. We, make, we have to vow those. We make vows for those. But we're all to live them to the utmost we can. The rule that St. Francis wrote for lay people gives the path, the road in which to do that. Essentially, it's the living of your, of your confirmation uh, grace. But what you hear when you make those promises is this. And if you keep these things, I promise you eternal life. You married people didn't hear that when you got married. There's no promise in marriage. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a vow that you take to be faithful to one another and to donate yourself one to the other for the bringing up of a little society. And you all know how fragile another person can be because they let you down. That's what humans do with each other. We, we're, we're, we're weak. When a priest is ordained a priest, he doesn't hear, and if you keep these things, I promise you eternal life. No. He risks his soul to become a priest. He might be lost. Because if he doesn't obtain to a salvation, if he leads, if he scandalizes someone, he might be lost. A bishop does not hear. If you keep these things, I promise you eternal life. You only hear that in religious life. It's the only state in the church where you will hear the priest say, and I, tell, and I say to you, on the part of Almighty God, if you keep these things, I promise you eternal life. You hear that in the third order of St. Francis. Lay people hear that because it's religious life. You see, it's a rule of life. It's a life of prayer, a life of penance, and it's a life dedicated to the church according to your state in life. Do you see? The, that's what all these popes are talking about. These quotes that I've read to you come from three encyclicals written about the, the third order, the popes promoting the third order of St. Francis. And I think I'm missing a sheet because there was another sheet in there that talked about that, and I don't have that here. So I'd encourage you all, if you are interested in that, to really pray about it and look into it before... If you think about it, St. John Bosco, third order member. Why? Because his mom was. He joined when he was probably 13, 14 years old. Now you can join at 14 years old. Before, almost everybody was, was, was third order Franciscan. But you might say, but I have a Carmelite spirituality. See, that's not, that's not what it has to do with. It's not about following a group. It's about, it's about Christian perfection. St. Francis, as the Pope said here, he was the first one to conceive of this idea of religious life being made possible for the lay faithful. Now, some people will tell you, but the Benedictines had it, St. Norbert, Norbert, Saint Norbert, he had it for the Norbertines. Those were called oblates. It wasn't religious life. Those were people associated to a monastery. This is not people associated to Franciscans, though they are Franciscans. It's people taking on religious life to strive in Christian perfection according to a rule of life that's been sanctioned by the church for the last 800 years. Do you see? And that's what, Saint, that's what the popes are saying. That would be for the greatest salvation of the, of the church. Why? Because it would make Christ present wherever you go. Not that you're not already supposed to make Christ present, but it gives you a framework from which to do that. 